You may be seated. I trust today that you can say it is well with your soul. It begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and uh, we discover that peace in walking with Him. I I want to uh, point out that this is a really big week in the life of Skycrest Community Church, as uh, this year we are beginning our 50th year in ministry as Skycrest Christian School. It's a fabulous ministry of our church. We are so grateful. Mr. Clagg is sitting back there. He's the leader of that group and the educational ministries here. And I want to tell you that for our 50th anniversary, God has graced us with more students than we have ever had at Skycrest Christian School. So it is going to be a, I think that we should give God praise for that because we know that to whom much is given, much is required. And we have the opportunity to invest uh, the truth of God's word in those students. And we have a fabulous team of committed followers of Jesus that are going to be investing in those kids from K4 through 8th grade. That all begins Wednesday morning. So uh, as you pray this week, thank God for that opportunity and just pray that all throughout the year we'll be planting seeds of compelling truth in the lives of those students and in their families so that they can come to know Jesus Christ. All right, you know what? I'm just going to pray for that right now. And uh, you guys, be sure and join us Tuesday morning on the gathering. We'll be praying for that as well then. But, I, you know, we all should be praying and we all should be grateful for what God is going to do through our team on this corner every day throughout the next two semesters. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of building on what has gone before, a firm foundation of noble intent was laid to partner with families, to lead children, to live their best life for Jesus Christ. And we are thankful, Lord, that we live in a nation where we can share the truth and teach the truth. And I pray, Father, that this year our students will grow, as it says of Jesus, in wisdom and stature and favor with you and men. We ask for your continued favor on the ministry of Skycrest Christian School and let your kingdom come and expand through that ministry this year. We look forward to what you're going to do and we'll be careful to celebrate your amazing grace in the process. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. All right. You know, one of the uh, craziest things that happened with Jesus and his disciples, and in my, it, it's actually my favorite thing that happened, took place toward the end of Jesus' ministry. There was tension building. Uh, the crowds were growing exponentially. And at the same time, the religious leaders were getting more and more committed to silencing Jesus. And the stress of it all was actually accentuating a a rift between the disciples. See, they believed, rightly so, that everything was coming to a head, that whatever Jesus was going to do was about to happen as they approached Jerusalem for the Passover. And in their minds, they were convinced that what Jesus was going to do was vanquish the Romans from the Promised Land And then he was going to set up a kingdom of God that would last forever by God's people for God's people. Now, as their hopes grew, so too did the rivalries within the group of disciples. They each wanted a place of prominence in his administration. And every chance they got, as you read the story, every chance they got, they were arguing about who deserved the most important posts in his kingdom. Now, finally, two of the disciples decided that they were going to take matters into their own hands. And in Matthew chapter 20, James and John decide that they're going to bring their mother into the discussion and see if she can convince Jesus to give them the good seats. Sure enough, they come, the three of them approach Jesus, they bow on their knees, and she and humbly before the rabbi, and he says, what can I do for you? 
And she speaks up and says, listen, Jesus, I, I want you to promise that my guys, James and John, will have the prominent seats when your kingdom is established. As a matter of fact, she asked that one of them would be seated directly on his right, the most important seat, and the other would be seated on his left, the second most important seat. And Jesus just looks at her and says, Listen, you, you don't really know what you're asking for. Those seats are established at a great price. And besides that, they're reserved for those God is appointing to fill them. Now, the scriptures tell us that when the other disciples heard this, in other words, they were eavesdropping because they couldn't figure out why the boys brought their mom to visit with Jesus, they were indignant with James and John. And, and things became so tense that Jesus actually called a team meeting just to get everybody settled down. Let's talk about this. We don't need this causing a division. Now, why were they indignant? Not just because the sons of Zebedee pulled rank and got their mommy involved, but mostly they were indignant because James and John beat them to the punch. Every one of the disciples wanted those seats, but no one as of yet had the audacity to approach Jesus to secure them. And we look at the disciples and we think, well, we expect more of these guys. Right? They've been following Jesus around. It seems like they would be learning. It seems like they would know that, that seats of prominence aren't the most important thing. But we need to recognize that it was just as natural for the disciples as it is for us. All of us desire the seats of prominence. We, we want to be first. And I can imagine that Jesus was frustrated with them about it because he had been warning them every chance he got, don't go there. Things in the kingdom of God work differently. It's not about the seats. As a matter of fact, one night at a dinner party, Jesus told a parable that addressed this very issue and the disciples were all right there listening. Or at least they were right there. It doesn't appear that they heard what he said any more than we hear what he says on this topic. I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Uh, if, if you want to follow along, if not, we're going to have the scripture on the screen for you. It opens, Luke chapter 14 opens with Jesus having been invited to, the Bible says, the home of a prominent Pharisee. So he was an important person. And the reason for the invite, allegedly, was to eat the bread of the Sabbath. But verse 1 tells us that the Pharisees really had him there so they could watch him closely. See, they thought if they put Jesus in a compromised position, he would break the rules of the Sabbath. And, and if he felt sorry for someone in the group, he would heal them. And healing on the Sabbath, according to the legalists, was a no-no. And guess what happened? Jesus had compassion on the man, and he healed him. He did it. And with all those witnesses there, the Pharisees just filed it away in their grievance file for Jesus so they could use it against him when the time came. Well, of course, Jesus masterfully challenged them on their thinking on the topic, and he let them know that he was watching them too. They may have brought him there to watch him, but he was there to watch them. And what he saw disturbed him. He was troubled. So he told them a parable, not a traditional parable like the prodigal son or the Good Samaritan, not one of those great stories that we're drawn to, but he told them a parable to make his point. 
he challenged them because of their pursuit of honor and prominence. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. When he noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he was watching. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the seat of least importance. But when you are invited... Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Uh, No wonder they weren't listening. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit is saying through this passage of Scripture, Lord. And and I pray that we would live it for your glory as we seek to advance your kingdom. Amen. Now, it's important to understand how these dinner parties work because they're, they're very different from the way it works for us. Okay, a host would decide that he was going to host one of these fancy parties, and he would send out invitations to the honored guests that lived locally and even regionally. And as those invitations went out, word would spread around the townspeople that there was going to be a party full of local dignitaries, and the townspeople marked it on their calendars too. Why? Because they went. They went to the parties. As the night of the affair approached, they would descend on the home where the party was going to be held. They didn't have seats. There wasn't anywhere for them to sit. But they they would just go and listen to the discussions because they were talking about politics and they were talking about religion. All the things that actually applied to them. They wanted to learn what these leaders were thinking And I would argue, presumably, they wanted to people watch. How did it go? And perhaps most importantly, what was the seating arrangement? Now, by the way, if you've ever wondered, uh, you remember the scene where Jesus was at the home of Simon the leper, and there were lots of dignitaries there, and a woman of ill repute, a sinner, came up to Jesus and anointed him with oil, and everybody was like, "Ah!" If he knew what a sinner she was, he would never let her touch him. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if she was so bad, why was she there? Because that's the way it worked. These, These uninvited guests were fine to be there, but they were to be seen and not heard. They were to be the ones listening. She broke rank when she approached Jesus and anointed him while he was seated at the table as an honored guest. Anyway, here's what, as the uninvited guest settled in, then all the invited guests would arrive. And since they had their invitations, they actually had seats at the table. But, and this seems like an oversight, would have settled some issues, there were no place cards dictating where they sat. So when they arrived, they would just take seats around the table. Now, the table was typically U-shaped, okay, and the host sat at the base of the U, and on either side of him were the seats of prominence. Remember James and John's mother let one sit on the right and the other sit on the left. That's because they were the most important seats. Then, after those two seats of prominence, everyone filled in around the table according to the host's Pecking order of significance. Okay, so here's the way it worked. The further away the seats were from the host, the less prominent its occupant. 
So the closer you got to the host, the more important you were. Now, the invited guests all had seats at the table, but not all the seats were created equally. You were defined by your seat. Now, one more thing you need to know about that culture. The most prominent guests arrived last. And so, since they were already seated, if someone was in the most prominent seat, it was the host's responsibility to rearrange the seating. It was his privilege. And they did it faithfully. Well, what's the big deal? In, in their culture, honor and shame were key issues of a person's identity, their worth, and even their character. So where they sat actually defined them in that context. For that night, they were valued according to the seat they occupied. And with the whole town watching, the seating was a really big deal. Among the invited guests, no one wanted to be stuck in or identified with the seats at the end of the table. So here's Jesus watching this all unfold, watching the big wigs pridefully jockey for a position, and he tells this parable that's not just laced with common sense, but it's overflowing with insight about the human psyche and how our broken hearts compel us to do the silliest things. Why did he tell this parable? Because all the invited guests at the party had the exact same issue. They had the same problem. They all wanted to be the most important person there. All of them. And if they didn't see sit in the seat of prominence, you know what they were doing? They were sizing up the person who was. How did he get there? That's my seat. And this jockeying for position creates bitterness and a judgmental spirit through which God can't work. We, we've said it before, but everybody wants to be somebody fancy. And sadly, we are all of us convinced that our value and worth is determined by the seat we occupy at the proverbial table. Because we believe that if other people see us as important, then we are. And if they don't, then we aren't. So we want those seats. And the pursuit of those seats makes us do crazy things. Like in this instance, Jesus is obviously watching people assume the seats they thought they deserved. This is where I should be seated. Presumably, there were people just plopping down at the head of the table. But, but they had two problems. First, they didn't know who was on the guest list. They didn't know who was going to be there. And second, they didn't know if, anyone, if everyone had arrived. Remember, the most important guest arrived last. And so seating themselves last meant they were running the risk of being moved. And if they got moved, they got humiliated. Humiliated. Sent to the end of the table in shame. So Jesus points out, hey, guys, listen, there's a better way to do this. There's a way you could choose to manage this situation that makes much more sense. This actually demonstrates you have some common sense. When you get to the party, go against the grain of your nature and take the last seat. Just go ahead and sit at the end of the table. Assume that every other guest who is invited is more prominent than you are. Why should we do that? Obviously, it's not true. 
Well, it's the safest thing to do. Because if you're wrong, what's going to happen is the host is going to come to you and say, hey, you need to move up here. There's a better seat for you. And if you're right, you've at least protected yourself from the humiliation of demotion. What's the message? Jesus is teaching about the importance of humility. Do we want to hear it? Humility. It's the importance of going against the grain of our thinking and choosing humility while at the same time minimizing the possibility of humiliation. Now, this is really important to understand. Okay, humility and humiliation have the same root word, and they both produce the same fruit, which is us being humbled. Humility protects, listen closely, humility protects and even portrays dignity while humiliation denies and even destroys it. Humility protects dignity and humiliation denies and destroys it. So let's just take a minute to define these terms. The root word for humility and humiliation is the same one. It's the Latin word humilitas. And that word means low. Low to the ground. When the word is used negatively, it means to be put low. To be humiliated. When the word is used positively, it means to lower oneself. It is to be humble. Now, the two uses are radically different. Humiliation is an awful experience. It is the awful experience of being robbed of dignity because we are shamed when we are humiliated. But humility, on the other hand, is the noble choice to direct your will and your power for the good of others. It is to direct your will and power for the good of others. So when we use our powers and our opportunities to promote ourselves, we are subject to humiliation, and that is devastating. But when we humble ourselves and we use our powers and opportunities to promote others, to elevate other people, then Jesus said, you're subject to honor. You've opened the door for the possibility that God himself will honor and exalt you. And you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. If, if, if we're spending our time pursuing honor and rewards, then certainly that's an indication that we are not humble. Wrong. That's wrong. The scripture does not dissuade or discourage us from pursuing honor or reward, what's discouraged is seeking it from the wrong place, from the wrong source. We sang about it earlier. Are you looking for the rewards of the world, or are you pursuing the rewards that come from heaven? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad in that difficult situation because great is your, say it, reward in heaven. In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus was saying, look, put yourself in a position with the mindset of humility that God rewards. 
Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25, he says, do you, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. If you're going to put your hand to the plow, plow the ground. Do the work. Do it with excellence. Get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. It's a crown from the wrong place. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Listen, Jesus held out the idea of rewards and crowns that they were as the golden carrot Pursue these things. Why? Because created in the image of God, we are wired up to do things, to pursue things that brings God, that will bring God glory. These, these are things that delight our Maker, and He responds to them by rewarding us, principally in heaven, certainly in heaven. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but even Jesus lived his life in view of the honor and the reward that he would receive when he finished the task. In the book of Hebrews, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Philippians chapter 2, Paul was writing to the church in Philippi to say, listen, think like Jesus. Look at the world from Jesus' perspective. And here's how he did it. This was his mindset, beginning in verse 6. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant moving to the end of the table, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And therefore God responded to his humble obedience. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." You see what happened? After finishing the work that Jesus was sent to do, he stepped out of eternity, where he was seated at the right hand of the Father in the throne room. He stepped out of eternity and into time and made himself nothing. And not only did he move to the end of the table, he actually got up. The Last Supper tells us he got up and took up a towel and a pail and he washed the disciples' feet. That's humility. It was so uncomfortable in that moment that Peter said, Oh, no, you don't. This is not happening. None of those disciples, not one of the twelve, chose to take up that towel and serve. Why? Because they were busy picking their seats. They were busy trying to see who was going to sit closest to Jesus. They all wanted to be somebody fancy. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. That's not how fancy is determined. In the kingdom of God, fancy is determined by service. Putting yourself low. So Jesus humbled himself. And he achieved exalted status. How did he do that again? Through humility. Look back at verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man. Fully God. Fully man. He humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death. Even death on the cross. 
the worst thing that could happen happened to Jesus. And we can't even move to the end of the table. Why? Because of what it says about us. I'm, I'm defined by my seat. Because of his obedience, he suffered the shame and humiliation of the cross. But in the end, he was rewarded with the exaltation of the name that is above every name. His reward came in his heavenly home. And his message today is that choosing humility is the key to experiencing the honor that we were created for. Choosing humility and serving God, that's, that's how we become fancy. That's, that's how our cravings are met. how we're satisfied do you, do you remember how Jesus finished up this parable in verse 11 of Luke 14 he said for those who exalt themselves will be humbled humiliated Solomon said it like this pride comes before a fall but those who humble themselves finishing up verse 11 those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's how it works. Why? Because when we humble ourselves, we invite God's presence. The book of Isaiah tells us that God lives in two places, high and lifted up in the holy heavens and with the lowly and contrite of heart. Those who choose humility. If you exalt yourself, Jesus said, count on it. You'll be humbled through the process of humiliation. You're going to be humbled. We are going to be humbled. And we can choose it. And if we follow Jesus and his teaching, his example, by choosing the more challenging but laudable path of humility, then in the end, God will lift us up. And when God lifts us up, we don't ever have to worry about a fall. You, you struggle. You put yourself in the most prominent seat. And you've always got to be looking over your shoulder. Right? Because the host may come and move you. If we want to receive the rewards of the kingdom of heaven, we must follow Jesus on the path of humility. Before I started this talk, we sang that great hymn of our faith, It is well with my soul. And the song is actually about the peace that we find when things are hopeless. If we are connected with Jesus, it doesn't matter how deep the pit. Okay, God's love and peace are deeper still. As the song makes plain, when we are with Christ, His peace is ours, no matter our circumstances. But I want you to think about how this relates to humility. There's a line that's often overlooked. In that song, but here's what it says. Whatever my lot, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Here's the bottom line of Jesus' teaching today. Whether man puts you at the head of the table or the foot of the table, whatever your lot, whatever your lot, if you're with Jesus, if you're plugged into Him by faith, if, if we're choosing to humble ourselves in the service and promotion of others, it will be well with your soul. It doesn't matter how man sees you or how man seats you. With Christ, it is well with your soul. Your identity, 
the dignity that we crave and the significance we long for comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So the truth is we should cease cease striving for the seats at the head of the table, the most important parking spots in the lot. Our identity is not determined by others. It is determined by our relationship with Jesus. And when we're following Him in humility, serving the promotion of others ahead of ourselves, God says, I'll come and I'll join you and I'll lift you up. God will lift you up. And when God raises us up, there's peace. It is well with our souls. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? The first thing I I just want you to consider is how humility plays into your connection with our Creator. Oftentimes in arrogance or in pride, we we try to establish things for ourselves. What, what, can, what do I need to do? I think I can do it. I'm, I'm going to overcome the problems of, in my life and I'm going to get connected with God. I'm going to do exactly what I need to do. And then Jesus comes and pays the price for us. He dies on the cross and is buried three days later, is raised from the grave. And the scripture says it's, it's by grace that you connect with your father through faith, not by work so you can't boast. Jesus paid the price. So in order to connect with our heavenly father, we have to humble ourselves and recognize this is, this is one problem I can't fix. This is only overcoming this despair and hopelessness or just this feeling that I'm not quite where I need to be. Overcoming all that begins with placing your faith in Jesus, humbling yourself enough to say, I need what you provide. Life. Forgiveness. A connection with my Creator. You can't get there in the absence of humility. You have to lower yourself to the point where you'll say, I need help. And then understand that's why Jesus came. To take your my place, to die for me so I could live. So I I want to challenge you, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, understand what he did. He humbled himself in love to seek you and find you and connect you with your creator. And then for those of us who follow him, let Let's just own this. It's it's a challenge to lower yourself. It's a challenge to go against the cultural grain and say, you know what, I'm 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 not who others say I am. I am who God says I am. But if we don't ever get there, will never be lifted to the place we were designed to occupy. So I just want you, as we wrap up today, either place your faith in Jesus, humble yourself and trust Him for a connection with your Creator, or ask God through His Holy Spirit to teach you, to show you opportunities 
to take the seat at the end of the table, to live with humility. Father, we recognize that you are the one who brings change and that you work in us and through us when we're humble. So, Lord, I pray that we would live with compelling humility, not for our glory, but for yours. So your kingdom will come in us and through us. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray.